You know, my parents have been touched by um, helping up Mission in a great way. They, whenever they're in town, they, once a month they go and serve. And I think that's how they've met most of the church, actually, is they'll see them there, and that's how they get to know the church, and they love it. My dad walks in there like he owns it, so it's very Italian of him. But anyway, I'm very grateful for you guys. Thank you so much. Um, well, let me pray. We'll read the scripture, and we'll dig in. Um, yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. Well, Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for your word. Uh, Lord, I thank you for these voices. Um, I've already cried three times today, so that's probably something. But Lord, I just pray for your spirit to be here. I pray for your spirit to work in our hearts. Lord, that your word would penetrate our hearts. That your word would be lifted up. Lord, and that we would know you better and love you more when we leave than when we came. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's read uh, Matthew 4, 12 to 23. Previous, uh, right before this is when Jesus has um, been baptized, and then he went into the desert, and this is right after that. So he's just starting his ministry. It says this, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, or Capernaum, which is by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. To fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. And this is actually the scripture in the lectionary that's for the Old Testament for this week. So just kind of like, like how it goes hand in glove. It says, the land of Zebulun and the land of, of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. And on those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew, and they were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I'll make you out, I'll make you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. And they were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. And Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father, and they followed him. And Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and synagogues proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. This is the word of God. So today, I thought I would take on a small topic of calling, because <laughs> why not, right? Um, but I'm actually going to do, as, I, as I've been like, thinking about this, and as I've been uh, reading this and preparing for this, um, it just kept coming up. And I was like, it doesn't, it, it kind of fits, but it doesn't. So I'm going to do a little, like, calling can be that big word that you can't really describe. It's like so big and lofty, right? I'm going to do, like, calling for beginners. All right? You with me with that? Calling for beginners. We can all get on board with that, right? So I'm going to talk about the who, the why, the how, and the what of calling from the scripture. And I promise, I'm, I'm not, it's not 12 pages. So we're going to go, we're going to run through this. But I think it's important to see this. And so the first question that I had is, like, who's called? Because don't you feel like, have you ever asked yourself the question, like, God, what are you calling me to, right? And sometimes I think we have this big, lofty, grand idea of what God is calling you to. And sometimes it is something more than just obedience. But most of the time, it's really just, follow me. It's like that simple. Here's what you're called to do. Follow me. So we're going to like take it down to that. So the first thing we're going to look at is who, right? Who does God call? And so as we see in the scripture, you know, he comes, he's walking along and he sees Andrew and he sees Peter and they're fishermen and he calls to them and immediately they leave and they follow. And then he goes and he sees James and John and they're fishermen and he calls them and they follow. So obviously it's fishermen. Okay, you guys, you're going to have to go with me on this, right? You're going to have to catch on here because this is, 
Okay, here we go. So obviously, you know, it's not fishermen. Now, obviously, Jesus can't do that now because he's not walking on the earth with us, right? So he can't, like, come up to you and tap you on the shoulder and be like, you know, Carrie, come follow me. And then you immediately stop what you're doing and follow him. That, that's not exactly how it happens anymore, right? We don't have the luxury of that anymore. But, but John 3.16 says that for God so loved the world, right? The world, that's very inclusive. That he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him may not perish but have everlasting life. So when we were dead in our transgressions and sin... And the God of the universe left his heavenly realms, put on skin, became like us, and came down and lived among us. He lived a perfect life that we couldn't live. He died on a cross to pay a debt we couldn't pay. He defeated death and, death, and in rising again, um, he, he conquered sin, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And with John 3.16 basically says that whoever believes in him, in this message, if you believe in this message, that that is your faith, your faith, right? Your trust in that is the activating ingredient that takes the truth of God's gospel, which is that Jesus has come, died for our sins, and you are made new, and it makes it a reality into your life. Right? Because he did that for the world. This is true for everyone. If you want to experience the truth of that, if you want to live the truth of that, then that's done through faith in him. That's done through belief in him. Right? So if that describes you, then you're a follower of Christ. And you are called. That's how God calls. Do you believe that? Then you're called. Okay? So if that, if that marks you... We've answered that question if you're wondering right now, am I that person? The answer is yes. Yes, you are. Okay? And some of you might say, like, I'm not that qualified. Like, I don't really have, you know, I'm not a fisherman. Or but when you start thinking about, like, when you start looking at the scriptures and you start thinking about who God did call, right? He calls, like, Moses, who had stage fright. He called um, Gideon, who was hiding in, like, a, a threshing floor, and God comes to him and says, you mighty warrior. And he's like, wait, what? Who are you? I don't understand. And it's always the least. It's always the, the least likely. It's always the lowest. It's always, and you're, they're all like, no, I can't. I can't do this. Right? And God's going, yeah, that's the whole point. See, that's the whole point. Because if, I, if you can do it through me, then anybody can do it. <laughs> right? Right? So who does God call? He calls every follower of his. Every person who has faith in him. Every person who has their trust in him. That's who he calls. Why does he call them? Because the people living in darkness have seen a great light. Because we, we are living in darkness. The world around us is dark. You know it. You experience it. It feels like it's getting darker every day. But just as before, when Jesus, you know, they have seen a great light, those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And Jesus is the light of the world, right? John 8, it says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have light of life. Right? Once again, Jesus is no longer walking on this earth, so he can't be that light. But if you believe in him, and you trust in him, and you're his follower, you are the light of the world. That's what he says in Matthew 5. He says, you're the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So who does he call? Everyone. Everyone. Everyone who believes in him. Why does he call? To be the light of the world. Wherever you go, whatever you, wherever you find yourself today, tomorrow, wherever you happen to be, you are the light of the world. Now, how do we do that? You're like, how do I, how do I, how do I live that out, right? Well, Jesus easily answers that, and he says, follow me. 
follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Right? Here's the thing. You follow, I'll do it. That's what God's saying. Let's not, over, let's not overthink it. Okay? We're really good at overthinking things. I'm like an expert at it. I was doing this study book. Have you guys ever done those study books where you like read a little thing and you read your scripture and then they have like questions <laughs> and then they give you like an inch and like, you know, this way and four inches this way to like answer your life question. So this is one that, um, it says this. What, what, what has God uniquely called you to do and are you filling God's calling on your life? And it was, you know, this much room. <laughs> and um, after I like rolled my eyes and was like, how am I supposed to answer that question, you know? This is what, um, this is what I wrote. Uh, you know how you have to like get past all that stuff? I do that a lot. I have to like get past a lot of the, all the stuff in my head that is stuff I think I should do or it should be and I have to get rid of all that and then the, the truth like shines, shines out of the light. And it said, so this is what I wrote. God has called me to everyday obedience. I'm to walk step by step with him, and if I do so, then I'm fulfilling my, new, my unique calling in life. Here's how I follow what God has called me to do. Here's how I know what God has called me to do. I follow him and say, God, what have you called me to do? What does that look like today as I'm walking into this meeting? Lord, what would that look like? How can I serve my family today? How can I, how can I serve my coworkers? How can I be a light in this class that I'm walking into? So how do we do it, right? So who is it? Everyone who follows Jesus. Why? Because there's, it's dark and you're the light of the world. How do we do it? We follow him. And lastly, what? What is the message? And to, to go through the message, you know, Jesus says, um, he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near, right? That may or may not work in your situation wherever you find yourself. Repent for the kingdom of God has come near. That may or may not work. I don't know. But I want to share this scripture. It's not up here because I'm going to just paraphrase because it's pretty long. But I think it, I think it, answers the question, because a lot of times we're like, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to do it? What's the... And we make it so much bigger, and God's like, hey, just come along. Follow me. Let's go do this. Let's go be the light of the world together. Let's make a change. And this is from, um, this is from Mark 5, and it starts like this. When Jesus was crossing the lake uh, to the regions of the uh, Gerasenes, Jesus got out of the boat. A man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. Okay, that's good. So far, good start. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. This is like who you want being your welcome committee, right? Somebody comes in, and this is the guy who greets everyone. This is awesome, right? In Luke, it also says that he's naked, so just add that to it, right? And so he comes up to Jesus, and he's, he's possessed. And so Jesus is going to, you know, he's going to cast out the demons. And he says, who are you? What is your name? And he says, legion, because there's many of me, because there's many of us, right? And so they beg Jesus to not put, throw them into the abyss. And so he sees this flock of pigs, right? And so he sends the spirit into the pigs. The pigs then turn around, run off a cliff, land in water, and drown. This is, quite, is, this is just how um, you know, sharing your faith should go, isn't it? We've all experienced this, right? And so... So the people that are tending the fish go back to the city and they bring all the people back and they're like, you're not going to believe what happened, right? And when they came back, when they came to Jesus, they saw the man, right? They saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there 
dressed and in his right mind. Here's the kicker. And they were afraid. Really? That's, you're afraid of that? We got a naked guy who lives in tombs, cutting himself and screaming out. That, you're not afraid of that? You're afraid of the guy in his right mind sitting here listening to Jesus? Come on, guys. <laughs> right? So here's the thing. So those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and was told about the pigs as well, and the people began to plead with Jesus to leave the region. What? I mean, does any of this, this so far doesn't make sense to me. Like, this is not how it should work out, right? So Jesus was getting in the boat. He's like, okay, if you don't want me here, here we go. Jesus gets in the boat, and he's leaving, and the demon-possessed man begs him. He begs him, Jesus, take me with you. And Jesus didn't let him go. The story gets weirder and weirder. He says, go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he's had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell, and began to tell what Jesus had done in the area of Decapolis. Um, Decapolis. Here's Jesus' message. Go back to your family. Go back to where you are. Tell people what Jesus did for you. No one else has that story. Nobody. It's your story. Just go back. Tell your story. This is what Jesus did for me. And you're like, that, that's so simple. How can that be that simple? Does it have any impact? Well, just a few chapters later, which um, many of the scholars say is about six to nine months later, Right? Jesus finds himself in the area in verse, um, chapter 7 it talks about how he's going to the area of Decapolis, right? And when he gets there, there's a crowd of people there. And this is where Jesus feeds 4,000 people. And he says this, he's like, I have compassion on these people for they've already been with me for three days and have nothing to eat. I'm, I'm afraid they're going to faint. So you feed them. Six, this is, just don't forget, don't forget, six months ago, nine months ago, they were begging him to leave. They were begging him to leave. The crowd, the city. There's 4,000 men, not counting women and children, who were sitting there for three days listening to Jesus. I'm not saying it's just this one guy, but this is what we know. There was one demon-possessed guy who was out of his mind, who Jesus restored and said, go back, go back home and tell people what God has done, with, done for you. And my, nine months later, there's 4,000 people sitting there, can't get enough of Jesus. It's not nothing. Your story is not nothing. It's true for you, it's powerful. It's your message. Guys, this is what God did for me. So who does he call? All those who have faith in him. Why? Because it's dark. And you need to bring the light. Um, I mean, simply he says, follow me. Follow me. This is how you do it. Follow me. And what's your message? what God did for you. Just go back home. Just tell him what I did. Tell him what God did for you. Do that. That's what these scriptures have shown me today, and I have to say that as I was going through this, I kept being reminded of um, when I met the Lord and how everything was new and how now things are so like, I'm used to God's graciousness. I'm used to God's mercy. And it kind of reopened my eyes to what God has done in my life. And so I've, I've been weeping a lot. So, and then we sing, like, Rescue from Lauren Daigle. You guys are killing me. That was amazing. But I'm, like, crying, you know. 
But the truth is God's doing something. And whatever he's done, whatever that is in you, that's enough. That's enough. Let me pray, and then you guys will come up and finish us with the song. So, Lord, thank you that your word um, sometimes gives us a clear light of things that we make more complicated. So, Lord, I thank you that you call us, that you, you call us to be a light in a dark world. And you've given us a message that is um, it's our message. It's my message. I'm the only one who has this message. This is what God has done for me. And I'm grateful for that. So I ask that you would bless us, that we would go out and we would be a church who is a light wherever we go. That we would know, we would be reminded of your goodness and of your graciousness. So Lord, we're grateful and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jen.